Well, good morning, Walden Church. This is our 4th of July celebration. This is our patriotic celebration. We really go all out here in Walden where we live for the uh, 4th of July weekend. We have a parade, we have a fireworks show, and of course we have our service here at Walden Church. And I thought, you know what, as part of our summer sermon series, we would just talk a little bit about being one nation under God. And so I'm gonna start with a story. It's a story from the very beginning of the American Revolutionary War. British Commander William Howe in 1776 was moving 30,000 British soldiers, they were veterans, and he was moving them to take New York. Now General George Washington, he only had 18,000 and they were very inexperienced troops. Of course, the British quickly outflanked Washington and he lost a thousand men and two top generals. Washington's troops were completely discouraged and without any reason, the British halted their troops. Now, if they had kept pressing on into New York, they would have destroyed Washington and his troops, but Washington and his troops were still trapped on Long Island. Now, the only route of escape was the treacherous East River, and the weather was very bad, and crossing that river seemed impossible. So, Washington called for a prayer meeting to ask for God's guidance and God's help. Washington then decided to cross the river. It was raining like crazy, and then suddenly, at 11 o'clock at night, the wind died and the rain stopped, and the river was as smooth as glass. Washington and his men started crossing the East River, and a gentle breeze came up behind them. But even with this miracle, it still would be impossible to get all the troops across to Manhattan Island before daybreak. So just before daybreak, a thick fog draped over them to hide them from the British troops. And when the fog lifted, the British commander was shocked. Washington's troops had escaped. Washington and his men recognized that day God's blessing on America. Now that seems like uh, a really fantastical story, right? A, a, an otherworldly story. It almost feels like it's, a, like it's not true, right? Like the story was somehow made up or embellished. Um, would God do something like that today? Could could a story like that, a story uh, that miraculous, happen today? I mean, last week we talked about how God is always at work. God is always moving. God is always speaking. And I asked last week, is it possible for us as Christians to miss it sometimes? Can we miss it? Can we miss God's movement? Well, what about as a country. Can we also miss it as a country, as a nation? You know, we're celebrating Independence Day, and I think we often think about fireworks and picnics, maybe going to the lake, or just, you know, hanging out with family. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of America, and maybe give a little bit of prophecy for where we're going. I, wanna, I want us to understand all the things that God has done for us in the past, but also remind you that we should be keeping our eyes open for God right now, in the present. First thing we have to do is realize what God has done. And really what God has done and why we celebrate this weekend is God birthed America. He really did. The Puritans' first act at Plymouth Rock was to kneel and pray and dedicate their new colony to God. In the first colonies in Jamestown, Virginia, the first community uh, building that was ever built was a church, and today it's the only original building that's still standing. Roger Williams was a Baptist minister. He established Rhode Island. Lord Baltimore held church services in establishing Maryland. William Penn was a Quaker. He established Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, Connecticut, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And when he was writing government policies for Pennsylvania, he made sure that all treasurers, judges, and elected officials professed a faith in Christ. And when you read the writings that these men wrote, you know that God was at the very heart of everything that they did. President George Washington said, it is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all the dispositions and habits 
that lead to political prosperity, our religion and morality are indispensable supporters. Even the very laws that we have are based on the original Ten Commandments in the Bible. Twelve of the original 13 colonies incorporated the entire Ten Commandments into their civil and criminal codes. The Supreme Court building, which was built in 1935, has a carving out in front of the building of Moses and the Ten Commandments. In the House of Representatives, across from the Speaker of the House, is a sculpture of Moses. President John Adams said the law given from Sinai was a civil and municipal code as well as a moral and religious code. These are laws essential to the existence of men in society, and most of which have been enacted by every nation which ever professed any code of laws. Vain indeed would be the search among the writings of secular history to find so broad, so complete, and so solid a basis of morality as the Ten Commandments lay down. The American Bible Society, a uh, society that still today uh, prints Bibles for us, it was started by an act of Congress from John Adams, our second president, and he served as their leader. The 1782 U.S. Congress voted in favor of a resolution recommending and approving the Bible for use in schools. Henry Lawrence, the fourth president of the Continental Congress, stated, I have the honor of being one of the framed, who framed the Constitution. In order effectually to accomplish these great constitutional ends, it is especially a duty of those who bear rule to promote and encourage respect for God and virtue. Patrick Henry, first governor of Virginia and a member of the Continental Congress stated, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The U.S. Constitution ends in the words, in the year of our Lord. The nation's motto is, in God we trust. Our pledge is one nation under God. God birthed America. God birthed America. And as such, like we saw with the Revolutionary War story, God has blessed America. The story of, of Washington, that's only one story, right? That's only one. The history of America has tons of these miraculous intervention stories from God. But things have changed, right? Things have changed. So, so I just wonder, did we change? Did America change? Did the world change? Are we still one nation under God? I mean, since the capital attack, January 6th of last year, it's kind of felt a lot like we are two nations. There's been a lot of talk about Roe versus Wade as of late, and it's become yet again one more thing for our country to be divided on. Back in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion. But why do we have these laws in the first place? You ever think about that? Why are we always making up new laws? At its most basic, a law is about managing conflict. We create laws when society wrestles with conflict. Some things like murder and theft, those are obvious. And, and those laws go back all the way to the Ten Commandments. But as time goes on and society changes, what becomes acceptable also changes. So legal systems adapt so they can provide clarity and context for what we would say is an unacceptable situation. And they also offer some guidelines as to the consequences for breaking laws. Because everybody in the world has a sense of morality. The welfare system was created to be a moral program. Concerns about global warming and animal rights and socialism, those are all moral issues. And as we vote on laws and politicians help legislate our behavior, we do that because we want everybody to act like us. We want everyone to act the same. But the rub becomes, your morality is not mine. I, I draw the line higher than you. I draw the line lower than you. But to be one nation, 
The solution is not more laws or less laws. And it's not a red white house or a blue white house. To truly be one nation, we must not neglect the next two words, under God. You see, the problem with using laws to regulate morality is that all of our laws are godless. They're just human attempts at morality. But see, people are created in God's image. And because we live in a fallen world, because we live in a cursed world, everybody knows something's off. Everyone can feel it. They know something's wrong. They know something is wrong, and so they create a moral law to try to deal with it. But the problem isn't that people don't have morals in America today. They do. And our problem isn't an economic problem. Our problem is not a government problem. Our problem is not even a technology problem. Our problem is not even an educational problem. Our problem is a spiritual problem. And the only answer to a spiritual problem is a spiritual solution. When politicians run for office, they always run on a platform. And their platform is made up of issues that they say will fix, right, all of America's problems. This morning, I'm not interested in anybody's political platform. Instead, we're going to look at God's, God's political platform. We sing a song, Our Country Tis of Thee, right? And in the very first stanza, it says, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. So the subject of the song is the country, right? But when you get to the third verse, it says, Our Father God to thee, author of liberty, to thee I sing. So we are singing about the country, and we are singing to who? God. We are singing to God. We are not singing these songs to patriotism. We are not singing these songs to the country. The first step to a nation under God is to remember where the worship goes. The worship needs to go to God. We're going to look at Psalm chapter 33 today. Starting at verse 1, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. America must worship God. Before we can talk about a morality issue or a right and wrong issue, America has a worship issue. Did you know that in Judaism, in the Old Testament, there was only four sins where the death penalty was attached? And one of those sin problems was the problem of idol worship. Sadly, today, in our modern culture and uh, the world around us, we tend to skip over idolatry. We say it's, uh, it's antiquated, right? We say, uh, it's irrelevant. We don't have idol worship today. But nothing could be further from the truth. Idolatry is in no way antiquated. It's not irrelevant. We might think the problem in our time is that, well, people don't worship any gods. People are atheists. But in truth, people today worship way too many gods. Christian writer Oz Guinness wrote, Idolatry is huge in the Bible, dominant in our personal lives, and irrelevant in our mistaken estimations. Idols and idol worship are a huge part of the war that is being waged in our lives and our hearts. There is a pantheon of counterfeit gods that are all vying for our allegiances. Every day we are bombarded with messages of power and success and entertainment and wealth and pleasure and romance. And through all of these things, the enemy seeks to convince us that somehow our lives are incomplete without them. And we can only be complete if we chase after these things, because all of these things promise to fulfill. And without them, we feel empty, we feel disillusioned, and we feel dead. 
Kyle Ottoman, in his book, Gods at War, he opens his first chapter with an illustration, and he talks about a man who is constantly coughing. Man's constantly coughing, it gets worse and worse and worse. Finally, his wife says, hey, go to the doctor. He goes to the doctor, the doctor runs a series of tests, and behind closed doors, the doctor discovers that the man has cancer. But the doctor is inexperienced. The doctor doesn't know how to tell the man he has cancer, so instead he decides, I'll, I'll lessen the blow and I'll just tell the man he has the cold. And so he gives the man cough medicine. The cough medicine alleviates the cough. The sick man feels better, but ultimately it does nothing for him because he is still dying of cancer. The same is true for us when we are concerned about all the symptoms that are on the surface of our country. Things like stress and cheating and lust and spending and worrying and Medicaid and laziness. If we only focus on symptoms, it does nothing about the underlying cause. We miss the real problem. And the real problem is the idolatry that takes place in America. We must praise God for his glory. We must worship him. What was the turning point for George Washington in that Civil War story I told? Washington called for prayer, right? He, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. And rather than rely on himself or others or some invention, right, he turned to God for guidance. He turned to God for help. Washington wanted direction. He wanted answers. And he admitted, it's not about me. When we say, God bless America, he has. God has blessed America. God has done great things for us. We, we thank God for what he does, and we should praise him every day for what he does. This is what it means to be a Christian that we praise God, we worship him, we give him thanks no matter what, right? No matter what. E even when we are surrounded in enemy territory and we think there's no way out, right? Even when times are dark. A true Christian would pray, Lord, I don't see you in the storm. I don't see you in it. I feel like I'm alone, but even though I don't see you, I know you are there. And I know that however things turn out, you're gonna work this for good. You're gonna do the things that you promise you keep your promises. That's faith. That's trust. That's worship. And God doesn't want us to worship him out of habit or, he, or just because, you know, it's, it's the next thing to do on the list. We do it because we, we have to. We have to give praise to the one who truly deserves praise. He is the one through whom all blessings flow. And if we want America to continue to be truly blessed by God, then we must praise God for who he is and for what he has done. We have to flee from all of the idols of this world. We have to stop putting our faith in our own creations, in our own pleasures. We have to get back on our knees. Let's look at what else uh, Psalm 33 says. Verse four, it says, for the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. That passage is a description of God's character. So they praised him for who he is, and then they tell you. This is why. These are all his attributes. And if we want this to be the land of the free, the home of the brave, then we need more of those attributes in our lives. We must become more like God. America must be more like God. You know, last week we asked the question, Jesus asked the question of his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? And that sounds like a really easy question for a Christian, right? We would say, uh, yeah, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. Okay. But if you were going to say you wanted to be more like Jesus, what does that look like? What does it mean to be like Christ? How would you describe Jesus? Loving? Forgiving, humble, compassionate, gentle, honest, composed, 
Jesus had self-control. He was patient. He prayed and he obeyed God. And if we want the world to change, if we think the liberals are too liberal, or we think the conservatives are too conservative, then it starts with us. It starts with us. It doesn't start with new laws. It doesn't start with regulating morality. It starts by us showing the world Jesus. We have to start practicing what we preach. Psalm 33 says that God's word is upright. That word literally means straight or level. It's this meaning that we say when we say uh, that, that that guy over there, he's on the level, right? It means that God is faithful. He is steadfast. And then the psalmist goes on to clarify their meaning when he goes on to say that God's works are done in truth. It literally says all his work, faithfulness. Everything that God does is according to his word. His word is true and it will be accomplished. Verse 5 says that he loves righteousness, loves judgment. In other words, God is a holy God who loves holiness. He loves purity. He hates sin, judges the world for sin because it is contrary to his nature. He is good. And he is so good that he poured out his judgment on sin onto his very own son who took our place. He is so good that he did that in order that we might be able to stand as righteous and blameless before him. That is the goodness of the Lord. That is the goodness that came into the world, even though it was the world that rejected him. The goodness that loved the world enough to give his only son to whoever would believe in him to receive everlasting life. That is the goodness of God. Philippians 2 says that we are to have the same mind as Christ. We are to be like him. We are to emulate him. If America wants to continue to be blessed by God, then we must hear this cry from Amos in Amos 4, seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Now the remnant of Joseph had failed to heed God's word and God judged them and punished them and sent them into exile. What do you think will happen to us if we don't listen, if we don't obey? Faithfulness, truth, righteousness, justice, goodness, we must be like God in his character. Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, he puts the deeps in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. America must recognize God as her founder. Psalm 33 takes it even further, right? It says God made it all. God made everything. And here's the thing. Since 1859, we have been teaching Darwin's origin of the species as an alternative to creation. And ever since our nation has used that theory, we have been trying to eliminate God as founder, to eliminate God as creator. Now, I don't know where you stand on evolution. Perhaps you think that God maybe used evolution alongside creation. But let me ask you a question. How do you reconcile the issue of sin with evolution? For instance, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that's the side of the gospel. The side of evolution says that lower forms of life evolved into higher forms of life. And for that process to take place, it took billions and billions and billions of years. After those billions and billions of years, animals evolved into prehistoric people, cavemen people, and then those cavemen people evolved into higher forms of people, right? So I want you to think, over the billions and billions and billions of years these things happened, 
for evolution to take place, things would have to be born and then things would have to die over and over again. Generations would come, generations would go. Do you see what that means? It means that if evolution is true, then death has been going on for billions of years before there was sin. Evolution says that death came first, that death came before sin. And if death happened before sin, then Romans 6.23 is a lie. And if Romans 6.23 is a lie, then the gospel is a lie. And if the gospel is a lie, then Jesus died for nothing. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. So verse 6 says, By his word, by his very breath, everything was made. Verse 9 says that he spoke it and it was done, and it didn't continue. When God rested on the seventh day, his creative act was finished. It was complete. Verse 9 says, it stood firm, which means it was done. Are we still teaching creation as a viable answer? Do you see what is happening? We are, we are all arguing about symptoms. We are arguing about abortion and homosexuality and gun violence and the economy and all of it, they are symptoms of cancer. A sin cancer that we are trying to regulate with late night talk shows, the news, protest marches, and passing our woes on to every new president. But none of that will fix it until we get back to what truly made America great and who is America's foundation? Why are we having all the problems with violence and immorality and perversion in our country today? Because God has given us over to our sin. Why? Because we have failed to recognize him as our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer, our king. Verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We have not feared the Lord. We do not stand in awe of him. America's problems will not be solved until we recognize God and his works. And we have to submit to his sovereignty. Psalm 33 verse 10 says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation and by its great might it cannot rescue. America must submit to God's sovereignty. America must submit to God. There is no doubt that our founding fathers put together the finest governing documents in the history of the world. They understood human nature and what they were guarding against, human tyranny. It was, it was brilliant. And there is no doubt that with, even, even with our current economic situation, American capitalism has produced the strongest economy the world has ever seen. There is no doubt that with our superior training and technological expertise, we have created the most powerful military the world has ever seen. We have the most advanced education system, the most advanced highest education system. We have the greatest supply of food and the scientific ability to manipulate those foods. We have the greatest healthcare and medical system, but none of that can save us. Those things can't deliver us. And if we trust in those things, we trust in vain things. Because all of those things can be gone in the blink of an eye. I mean, we know that, right? Didn't we all feel helpless when COVID started? Didn't we all feel helpless when we heard reports of mass shootings? We feel helpless when the doctor tells us that we have cancer. So what sustains us as a nation? Not our constitution, 
not our government, not our national pride. The only thing that sustains us is the Lord. It is his counsel that stands forever. He is in control. The minute we begin to think otherwise is the minute we begin to trust in vain. We must trust in God and his sovereignty. One more. Verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. America must trust God's plan. We have to trust God's plan. I know we're all looking down the road, right? And we're unsure of where America is going and we're unsure of who she is becoming. We're worried about the America that our grandchildren will inherit. But part of submitting to God's authority is also trusting in his plan. God is in control. He is still sovereign. He still has a plan and his plan will be accomplished. Verse 18 says that his eye is upon those who fear him and who hope in him. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then that promise is for you. He will deliver you. He will sustain you, even in dark times. He will be your help. He will be your shield. He will be your defender. Do we have concerns for our nation? Does our heart break when we see how things are going? Do we want our nation to turn back to God? It's not going to happen through political reform. It's not going to happen through elections. It's not going to happen through protests. It can only happen through a mighty movement of God's hand. Do you long for that to happen? Or do you just want to see the economy pick up? Do you just want to see gas prices lower a little bit? That's not enough, is it? That's not enough. If I'm going to say, God bless America, then I want God to truly bless America. I want him to truly bless America with his presence. I want him to truly bless America with revival. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Notice who the Lord is talking to. He's not talking to those people. He's not talking to the president. He's not talking to bankers. He's not talking to Congress. He's not even talking to the lost. He is talking to us. He is talking to his people. That means we need to spend less time in the streets holding picket signs and more time on our knees holding hands. When Washington was surrounded, and all hope was lost, he called for a prayer meeting. He asked for God's guidance, and he asked for God's help, because he recognized God's sovereignty. He recognized that God was in control. He worshiped God, and he said, we need to be more like him. When you are lost or confused about where to go, all we need to do is humble ourselves and seek his face. Let's pray. Lord, when we say God bless America, we mean it. It is our prayer. It is not just our motto. God bless America is our prayer. And we would ask that you would continue to bless America as you always have. Thank you for our country. You created our country. You have sustained our country. You have built our country. You are the father of our country. We enjoy our freedoms because of you. We enjoy everything that we have because of you. It is you who are king, you who are sovereign, you who sustain us. Lord, may we as a nation continue to seek you first.
put you first in all things. May our nation put you back where you belong. May we be united. May we again be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Hey, I hope you have uh, a great 4th of July weekend. I hope you have a great celebration. Stay safe. Uh, And don't forget, we are here every Sunday. We have services. We have two every Sunday. We have one at 930, which is our traditional service. And then we have one at 11, which is our contemporary service. Uh, We have a youth program and a children's program during the 11 o'clock service. And we have coffee and donuts in between. We would love to see you. And we would love to be the church where you live. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.